23 and a half minutes now past 7 o'clock. Interesting study that found that where and how you live when you're in kindergarten plays a huge role in how well you read in grade 7. You got the connection? It starts in kindergarten, manifests in grade 7. That's the conclusion of a study conducted by UBC's Human Early Learning Partnership, which was published this past week. And joining us to talk about the findings, lead researcher Jennifer Lloyd. Jennifer, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Well, I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> I'm okay. I'm not sure if your producer told you. Yeah, I'm I was in my car right now. <laughs> we should tell folks we had hoped to speak to you in your home, but you're now a little distracted because you're in your car. There was a what? A, f- a fire alarm went off in your building. A fire alarm. Yeah. So my husband, my baby, and I are sitting in our car right now, trying to figure out what's going on, but. We're still here. <laughs> but everything with the building appears to be okay? Yeah, it looks like it might be a false alarm. Okay, we'll keep our fingers crossed for you. Thank you. Now tell us about your connect- the connection you found between kindergarten and reading skills later in life. Well, we found that contrary to uh, possibly what's been found in the past is that it's not necessarily where you live in grade 7 that matters for grade 7 reading comprehension performance. It's actually where you live seven years earlier when children are in kindergarten. So explain to me how socioeconomic conditions you experience when you're five are so Mm -hmm. critical to your reading abilities when you're 12. Well, uh, previous research suggests that uh, areas that have these higher concentrations of of, uh, disadvantage or what we call poverty have been linked to things like infant mortality and higher uh, teen delinquency rates and so on and so forth. But um, we can only speculate about what role that actually plays for children when they're in kindergarten. Uh, One of the things that we can speculate about is that these areas that have higher rates of poverty are areas that perhaps have fewer uh, programs and services geared towards young children and that there may be simply uh, uh, challenged resource allocation in these neighborhoods, which has deleterious effects for children's reading outcomes. So then can I say if if your socioeconomic and living conditions improve in grades 1, 2, and 3, your reading skills will improve as well? Well, this would actually uh, perhaps cast doubt on something like that, because this is really? saying that even if you were to move out of that neighborhood into a neighborhood of higher affluence, your scores might not necessarily improve. At least that's the overarching trend. Now, we should, we should bear in mind, of course, that we are also already controlling for family income in our, in our study. So these are the neighborhood-level findings over and above what we know about the individual families. So it stands to reason a child might be from an affluent family but live in a disadvantaged neighborhood in kindergarten. And this would actually suggest that if that's the case, it doesn't matter necessarily where they move after the fact. It's just what happened in kindergarten that was the most important. How much influence does the teacher have on? Because even if you lived in a poor neighborhood and you've got a great kindergarten teacher, doesn't it help? Oh, certainly, certainly. Uh, You know, a a child, an individual child is influenced by a milieu of of adults around him or her uh, that all all contribute to helping these children thrive, to be sure. So we know that, for example, here in British Columbia, there are certain neighborhoods that have socioeconomic conditions that would look on paper to be quite bad, but in fact the children are actually doing better than we would expect given those socioeconomic characteristics, which does speak to the fact that there are parents uh, and community members and leaders alike who are actually uh, targeting young children with their programs, to be sure. Yeah, because this kind of information, Jennifer, as you well know, could be very discouraging to parents who are listening right now who are living in a poorer neighborhood. So what can they do on an individual basis to help their children overcome their surroundings? Certainly. Well, one thing I just want to clarify is we know it's not realistic for people, particularly in disadvantaged neighborhoods, to simply pull themselves up, contact their real estate agent, and move to an area of higher affluence. I mean, that's certainly not realistic. So I think that... um, what this study really highlights is not necessarily uh, the sole responsibility of parents and educators to be concerned about children's literacy development, but it also implicates the role of community leaders and policymakers to make sure that there is uh, more effective resource allocation and that there are simply more programs put into place targeted towards young children in particular. We should also point out there's many doctors, engineers, lawyers, and Nobel laureates who have come out of poor neighborhoods as children. This is true. This is true. And I think that there are some examples of people who come from affluent households who uh, aren't necessarily doctors and lawyers either, so it works in reverse. (laughs) So what would you like to see done after reaching this conclusion? 
Um, uh, well, a couple of things. I think that uh, the primary one, though, is that uh, we recognize that early child development is not simply an issue of, of private concern for parents, and it's not simply an issue of institutional concern for schools, but it's also an issue of neighborhood-wide concern and certainly of concern for policymakers. So continuing to... Um, uh, just be think, thinking very creatively and out of the box about how we approach early child uh, development over time and in literacy in particular um, by, by, you know, considering other programs and resources that we can gear towards young children. Jennifer, interesting study. Thank you so much for sharing it with us, and, uh, and best of luck with the, the, the apartment today. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Jennifer Lloyd, researcher with UBC's Human Early Learning Partnership, so what do you think of the study's finding? What do you think of what you just heard? You can offer your thoughts on TalkBack, 604-662-6690.